stirred the Bertha issue once again. Uh, I first saw her, and I think in a Tea Party meeting, I think in Knoxville or someplace in Tennessee. And um, they were holding a meeting, and all pe people were up doing all kinds of various things. And Mickey ran down the aisle saying, "My son was born in in, in Hawaii." And I've got a Hawaiian birth certificate, and I know what it looks like. And all. I said, who is this woman that's uh, creating all this sand at this meeting? And immediately, just on television, not knowing her, but seeing her on the news, fell in love with her courage and her commitment uh, to this issue of demonstrating Obama's ineligibility. And I think we all know by now there's no need for us to beat that drum uh, while we're going to continue to press the issue that he is wholly and completely ineligible. This issue was also raised by Dr. Jerome Corsi, who really is the father of the entire movement. He opened the eyes of the nation and the world, and Mickey's eyes were open as well. But she comes from Hawaii. Uh, she lived there for a number of years until she met her dashing husband, Fred. Where is he at today? He's someplace, there he is, right over there. Until she met him, and he took her out of Hawaii and took her down to Oklahoma and bought a horse for him with chickens and snakes and all kind of stuff running around down there. Anyway, she's a tremendous patriot. She was here for the, the uh, 2010 CIA Columbia Obama Sedition and Treason Trial. She testified at that trial during that period. And uh, she's been continually active uh, in the process. We have spoken together. We were in a conference in Dallas. Uh, going back a year or so ago, she came and was a part of the release of the transcript of the CIA Columbia Obama Sedition and Treason Trial. She's been a guest in our home. Uh, she's a great friend of Mother Katura. They are talking partners, and she's right now being housed by uh, Mother Katura. Tremendous woman of God. But the other day, uh, someone informed me that Mickey was back in the news again, and it was Al Sharpton that was slamming her. And Al's a well, anyway, he was depicting Mickey as some sort of a wild person that's crazy and these are the kind of racist people that don't like Obama and we got to stop this racism and, and on and on and on Al was going and showing her picture and how she was challenging uh, some congressman Mark somebody down in, in, uh, in Oklahoma. And first Al said something on order, well, you know, Republicans and conservatives are finally getting the word because he was saying that this Republican congressman was slamming and ignoring Mickey. He may have thought he was doing that, but actually Mickey was upstaging him. She's a very tenacious fighter. So the Blaze picked it up, Glenn Beck picked it up, all the media picked it up, Drudge was talking about it. So, and that was just a couple of months ago, less than a month or so ago, I think. The issue is not going to go away. Uh, and as we stated, I think, the last night or some other point in time, that those who are, and I'm not necessarily in, in love with the term Bertha, uh, but I'll wear it, and I'll wear it proudly. Uh, but Mickey is now known as the Bertha Prince. All it takes is the queen, I think. And, <laughs> and uh, Mickey is the, um, is the princess. She's a tremendous woman, just a great friend as well. A supporter of this ministry as well, she sends, she and Fred, donates to this ministry on a monthly basis. We're just so blessed, blessed to have people that give to us, love us, and support us, and then will come and speak. She spoke for us once again. Mickey, come on up. Uh, once, uh, some time ago, and it was a blessing, and we're so honored to bring her back to the pulpit again. Would y'all please stand and receive Mickey Booth. The birth of Princess. Here I am. <laughs> I guess I've been anticipated this moment for uh, quite some time, and um, my husband makes me very nervous because uh, I've been here now to the Outlaw Church and my family four times. Um, now, and the last time was for the Bathsheba, Bathsheba, Bathsheba Women's Conference where I spoke. The time before that, um, I was here for the transcript, tri uh, the uh, yeah, the transcripts release um, committee meeting, and before that, I was here for the trial. And the way I found out about it 
was um, I've been a fan of Pastor Manning ever since I saw the first YouTube video. I just fell in love with that. Man of truth, he's exactly right. Long-legged Mac Daddy. The whole deal about Obama, he had it in a nutshell. He had it. And um, the things that he knew and was saying about Obama, I knew as well. Because, uh, you know, being from Hawaii and um, uh, Fred, my husband, born and raised there, uh, in fact, he's got some Hawaiian blood in him, and um, the Haole, or Caucasian side of him, comes from New York, King Kingston, New York. And this is Fred's first trip here. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that, but um, I also wanted to mention, as I stand up here, I want to grab this microphone and walk around, you know, like, uh, like Coach Dave does, and uh, make everybody think that I'm very comfortable up here, and I do it all the time. <laughs> But uh, actually, I don't. And uh, like I said, I was very nervous. <laughs> the first time I was here for the trial, it was, uh, you know, to me, a very exciting, you know, kind of um, intimidating kind of thing. But uh, I found out about the trial from a person who became a very good friend of mine, Victoria Windsor. And she's in Virginia, and she was helping um, Pastor Manning with the trial. And uh, she had all the connections. She's the one that uh, got me connected, you know, with uh, actually with the cold case posse, um, uh, uh, so many things. Victoria was a resource who uh, had all of the goods on Brennan, you know, um, Muslim Brennan, who is now the uh, um, CIA, is it CIA director now? Um, all of Obama's uh, communist group are, have filled all of these important um, positions. Now, Victoria had the goods on him. She knew all about the passport uh, records breach. She knew about his business that was a contractor for the passport department. She had all of the goods on the Diebold voting machines that were vote stealing machines that uh, the Princeton University was able to prove and uh, show, you know, on, on video how it's done, where um, they had these, these uh, Obots, the Obot, um, or the Obama operatives, go in with a card and uh, um, program the machine, and at the end of the day, get the numbers out of there. But what they did, they put in a card, basically, that for every two votes that went to, or every vote that, every two votes that went to John McCain, one was stolen for Obama. And so this has gone, this went on, you know, throughout, uh, um, you know, every precinct in the, in the United States, predominantly the black ones, of course, because, you know, it was all for Obama. And uh, so that was how a lot of the, the uh, fraud went on, and that ha that's how it continues to go on today. So Victoria was the one that turned me on to all of this. Uh, she just, um, you know, became my best friend. Uh, as I was writing my book, which basically was my experiences of uh, uh, trying to expose Obama's frauds and what I was doing personally, because that's all I know. And, um, and that's all I know as I stand up here and speak to you are the experiences that I've had, you know, that have brought me to this point. So Victoria died last year, and with her passing went a, a resource that, um, that, you know, is so you know much missed, and I miss uh, my you know my best friend because I talk to her every day, and uh, I would ask her, Victoria, get me this, find out about that, um, doing the research for my book, I need this and that, and she got it for me. So when um, I'm not sure how many of you know about it, but there's a list of 50 or 60 names um, and incidences of people that have died under Obama's watch, including the um, homosexual young men in Chicago. Victoria is on that list because she died under mysterious uh, circumstances. She um, became ill very suddenly, went into the hospital, went into a coma, and died, you know, shortly after. And it, they said that it was uh, liver failure that, you know, came on suddenly. And um, she wasn't a, a drinker, which usually, you know, um, liver disease, cirrhosis of the liver, um, you know, is uh, um, more commonly, you know, connected to, to drinking. And, um, but she wasn't a drinker, and 
Um, it all happened so suddenly, and because it's the liver, when I talked to Orly Tates and told her, her immediate thought was that poison, you know, is something that goes directly to the liver. So we were all sad to, you know, for that to happen. We miss Elizabeth tremendously. I'm sorry, not a, uh, Victoria. And it was Victoria that uh, got me involved here. She says, do you know about this CIA Columbia trial? Well, I didn't. So she filled me all in and everything. And, and um, uh, so, you know, knowing Pastor Manning through the YouTube videos and um, keeping up with things there, I knew about the trial, but Victoria was involved here and she, she helped out uh, uh, with some of the arrangements for that. Um, as I lose my, like I said, I don't do this all the time, so sometimes I lose my train of thought, but I don't want to forget the first thing I meant to do when I came up here was to thank you very much for having me here. And um, it's a great honor and a privilege to be here. It's uh, been a tremendous experience for me this time, not only because I'm um, baptized uh, into the church, I'm a member of the church, and that my husband is here with me. Usually, um, my husband is not, doesn't accompany me on these uh, Tea Party protests that I go to or speak at. He uh, usually stays home and encourages me from the sidelines. I do a lot of um, radio interviews now, and as I'm on the phone in my pajamas or whatever, you know, <laughs> that I'm wearing because it's radio, and talking on there, um, he'll be listening to me and not hearing what is on, who's on the other end of the phone and what we're, you know, um, discussing. He'll come over with a piece of paper like, well, you haven't said this yet. You know, you got to mention this and don't forget to say this. And then I'm trying to listen and then I'm looking at what he's trying to say here and I'm like, you know, and so, um, but anyway, he, he interrupts like that, um, good intentions and everything. He just doesn't want me to forget something important that I need to say. Well, he, um, one of the few times he accompanied me on, um, on a speaking engagement was when I was invited by uh, Rudy and Aaron Davis to come to the uh, Constitutional Eg Eligibility Summit that was in Dallas, and Pastor Manning was there as well. And um, uh, um, I'm sorry, yes, uh, Dr. Yes was there, and uh, also, Pastor Carl Gallops was there, and I spoke to him just the other day, and he wanted to make sure that I tell you um, that he loves you and that he wished he could be here, but uh, he did want me to say that. And a number of people have um, emailed me and mentioned on Facebook when they found out I was coming here to also say, um, you know, uh, give you their love and, uh, and, and thanks and everything, and to Elizabeth as well. So going back to this <laughs> Dallas conference, I... Uh, as you can see, I don't have a speech written out because I never follow it anyway. I go off on a tangent, and that's why Fred is there to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that I don't forget everything. So at that Dallas summit, I came up here all organized with my iPhone, and I was going to make sure I wasn't, I didn't get embarrassed by going over my um, minute, you know, minutes of talking. So I was over there trying to set a timer and stuff, and then um, I begin my, my talk, I start speaking, and then all of a sudden I see Fred back there going, you know, something or another, and it totally just, you know, stunned me, and I stood here like I didn't understand what he was trying to tell me, so... <laughs> But anyway, that, that's, uh, so oh, I was going to ask Mother Keturah and, and um, praise, if you will, go on either side of him and uh, tie his hands down or something so he doesn't give me one of those signals, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, you know, Fred, Hawaiian blood, born and raised in Hawaii. Um, I'm half Japanese and um, half Dutch and uh, went to Hawaii at age four years old, and uh, that's my home, Hawaii. Uh, our son was um, um, born in Kapiolani Hospital. Fred was born in Kapiolani Hospital, you know, Obama's uh, professed um, hospital that he was born in. And, um, oh, uh, here I go off again. Uh, when we were here at the trial, um, I remember the jury box was um, over there, I think a couple, layer, couple of uh, steps, and the jury was there, and the witness seat was right here, and Judge Unger sat right up here, and um, the uh, prosecutor table was there with Pastor Manning at it. 
I'll tell you, I was never so impressed in all my life. If I, you know, this man, I figured he was, you know, um, a lawyer through and through. I mean, he just, it was fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. So um, that, was, that was quite an experience. And again, you have to remember, I'm just this little girl. I always think of myself, you know, as a little girl in Hawaii surfing because those are the days of my childhood that I remember. And just uh, kind of, I don't like the name free spirit, but I did my own thing. The ocean, you know, was my, was my home, my backyard, my playground. I loved it. And as I grew older, um, it was the horses, you know, I always loved horses. So we got, uh, the other night, um, you, were, you were speaking about how the millionaires and billionaires are being called, you know, invited to, uh, to New York, and it's displacing all of the, uh, we call them, you know, the local people that have lived here all of their lives. And as rents and uh, price of homes and price of everything is going up, can't afford it anymore, and you get pushed out. You end up, you know, leaving to, to other places, and, and that's even hard to do because so many in the community, especially the black community, you know, can't afford, they don't have jobs, and they can't afford to do that. And, and so when, I, you know, when you said that, I thought that's exactly what happened to Hawaii. That's, that's exactly what happened there. You know, many years ago, people, when the Japanese came and the rich, uh, Haole is the name for the Caucasians. And so you know, we easily uh, say that, that it, you know, the, the Haoles, uh, rich Haoles, like the rich Haoles that go to Punahou School, that can afford to go there. That's what lo local people always called Punahou. And um, uh, I'll get back to talking about that, but um, we were basically pushed out of Hawaii. We couldn't afford it. Fred was retired from the police department, working, uh, um, retired from the police department and pulling a uh, pension from the state. And we were living on different islands because his job was in Honolulu. My job was on the big island of Hawaii. And uh, I worked, a sec I worked a, my first job was as a director of uh, leisure sales for the Hiltons in Hawaii. And so that, you know, that was my job. I was a salesperson. And um, I worked a second job just, uh, you know, working for an electronics department so we could make ends meet. And our, what needed to be met, you know, was uh, quite expensive. We, my son, since Fred and I only have the one son who was born in Kapiolani, our son Alan, and he was uh, delivered by Dr. David Sinclair, and for real, where um, Obama, you know, I don't know where they pulled that name up, but they say Obama was delivered by da David uh, Sinclair, and that is crap. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so anyway, we, um, we put him in private school and it got to where we just couldn't afford it anymore and uh, we had a couple horses and we couldn't afford to keep them anymore and we said, you know, Fred, you're retired but um, looking in the future, if we stay in Hawaii, we're never going to be able to retire. It, it, uh, it's all the rich people that have come in and bought up the places, you know, forcing local people to uh, live, you know, multiple families in one household. There were a uh, big influx of um, uh, Vietnamese that came over uh, after the Vietnam War. There were uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, third world country people coming through. And since Honolulu was an immigration port, uh, as they came through uh, Honolulu before going on to the other states, they, um, two out of three immigrants were staying in Hawaii. So the population just boomed overnight to over a million, over a million people and, you know, just uh, seven small islands. That's a lot of, um, you know, people to, to be there. But it was the rich coming and it was the local people that had been born and raised there that moved to Vegas, California, uh, Oregon, Washington, and um, two people moved to Oklahoma. Three, three, our son. Thank you, Fred. Tie his hands. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, that's our kind of a little more information about our family. And um, just so we know that uh, we're in Oklahoma now. I mentioned Fred's family being from Kingston, New York. We came here on Wednesday, and Fred's cousin, who we'd only met once in Hawaii, um, has wanted Fred to come to Kingston 
for many, many years because they said, this is your roots. You know, it was uh, two Booth brothers back during the Spanish-American War came from Kingston and were assigned to Hawaii. And it was just mentioned to um, someone speaking up here about how, how Hawaii became, what was it, like a monarchy? Because they went out and they got all of the, got the Philippines and all, and all these other, um, you know, countries during, during that time period, so 1899. Um, and that was the same time that the Americans um, conquered Hawaii without a shot. They basically deposed the Queen of England. I'm, there you go, thank you, Fred, I saw that. Um, the Queen of Hawaii, Queen Liliuokalani. And uh, at that, when, when the Queen was deposed, it was the Marines that came in and basically took over the islands. So knowing, you know, we've got all this history of Hawaii, and, and, um, and now I'd lost my train of thought just for a moment. The two Booth brothers, one was Fred's grandfather, um, who's, he's named after Frederick Newton Booth. And the two brothers uh, went to Hawaii and they wrote back letters and they uh, sent information from that time period that is now in the museum in uh, uh, Kingston, New York. So when we came over here, we came two days early so that Fred's cousin, David Ramsey, Colonel David Ramsey, who is retired uh, from, from the um, army. He wanted to show Fred his roots, and so he took us up to Kingston, he took us to the museums, and we um, you know, looked at all of the Booth things. We went to the Booth um, Cemetery, where the Booths were, where his grandfather and all of the uh, grandfather's brothers are buried, along with their father, who was, uh, I guess, uh, Nathaniel Booth, who was once the owner of a, um, bluestone mine, which they have a lot of in upstate New York. So we go to the cemetery, and it's this gigantic monument, huge, like one of the biggest ones in, in the whole cemetery. And I looked at, you know, Fred, this is Fred's family and stuff. We're in Hawaii, you know, we're nobody. We're just, and here it is. And I said, my gosh, Fred, you're somebody. <laughs> so Fred's cousin, David, um, is uh, like a co-director of this organization called Soldier Sailor, Soldier Sailors Marine and Airmen's Club that has these facilities that was founded in 1919. And it's over on Lexington Avenue, you know, real close walking distance to everything. This is set up for um, any uh, military, active duty, retired, family, whatever. Um, with a rate of like $50 for like if a, a soldier was coming to town. Now I'm looking out there and I know you've got a lot of relatives, you know, a lot of people um, that you know that are serving or have served that are eligible to use this facility and nobody knows about it. Now the press had a good chance to, to tell everybody about this the other day because um, for, uh, was it Friday or Thursday? Friday. Friday was the uh, um, prisoner of War Missing in Action Remembrance Ceremony. How much time do I have? Okay, because I want to do this. There was a ceremony that um, Fox 7 had a truck outside. Now, what they did, you know, they, they, um, they had all of the um, services represented and they had a table in honor of the you know, POW, the MIA. In the, in the uh, cantina where they held this press conference, there was the big black flag, POW, MIA. And in front of it was a table. It was set with a white tablecloth. And if you can just all imagine this with me, I'll explain. It had a, um, a, a chair, one chair, and it was tipped up like it was, they were expecting someone to come. And then I got a copy of the script so I could give it to you. And uh, I think you'll understand the significance of this, where this administration, the press and all that, they don't like our military. And so they don't help them in any way. And they don't care. And they don't care about the POWs and the MIAs. They don't care about our soldiers. Um, this is how it goes. 
As you entered the room this morning, you may have noticed a small table in place of honor. It is set for one. This table is our way of symbolizing the fact that members of our profession of arms are missing from our midst. They are commonly called POWs or MIAs. We call them brothers. They are unable to be with us this evening, so we remember them. This table, this table for one is small, symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner alone against his oppressors. Remember. And at that point, um, an army, uh, I say person because I don't know ranks, but um, an army guy in uniform came up and he placed an army flag on the table. And then the tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms, remember. And at that point, a sailor, dressed in his Navy uniform, came over and he set a Navy flag down. And then the single rose displayed in a vase reminds us of the families of loved ones of our comrades in arms who keep the faith awaiting their return, remember and a Marine set the Marine Corps flag on the table. The red ribbon, ribbon tied so prominently on the vase is reminiscent of the red ribbon worn upon the lapel and breasts of thousands who bear witness to their unyielding determination to demand a proper accounting of our missing. Remember, at that point, an airman set the Air Force flag on the table. The candle, the candle is lit, symbolizing the upward reach of their unconquerable spirit. Remember, and at that point, a Coast Guardsman set the Coast Guard flag on the table. A slice of lemon on the bread plate is to remind us of their bitter fate. Remember, and a Navy man put the Navy flag on the table. There is salt upon the bread plate, symbolic of the family's tears as they await. Remember, the glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us this night. Remember. And, and um, the Navy person, is that all the flags or did we get the Coast Guard? But the Coast Guard said, the chair, the chair is empty. They are not here with us today, remember. All of you who served with them and called them Conrads who depended upon their might and aid and relied upon them, for surely they have not forsaken you, remember. Remember until the day they come home, remember. So, like I said, I wanted to come up here and do this because I want it on record. Because for the few people that were in that room, nobody knew about the ceremony or even cared. And it was the press that was missing in action. I have the um, information of the Soldier Sailors Club that I'll give you that information uh, sometime and you can post it because uh, so few people know about it, and like I said, it's been there for a long time. It's for our military, and we honor them. Uh, now, the Birther Princess. <laughs> um, also, something that happened here, you know, last night in the church, and Pastor Manning is saying, you know, um, challenge wrong. Challenge the wrong that you see. Go out there and challenge it. And I think this is why I've been invited back time and again is because I do challenge it. And I get right in their faces. And I got right in the face, face of Dan Boren and I told him, you know, I'm running against you for the U.S. House of Representatives uh, District 2, Oklahoma. And I'd like to debate you. And I would also like to um, challenge you in a marksmanship contest. And... <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, Defender, I've got my uh, six-shooter on my necklace and also on my earrings, and I can assure you I'll make sure they're not on me when I go through the airport and TSA. <laughs> so I uh, challenged him. Um, I challenged uh, Jim Inhofe, Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma, when he knew what I was bringing to him, which was Fred's and Allen's birth certificate and Obama's phony short form. And uh, when he found that out, the group that I was with, he let only one person go in to speak with his chief of staff in the Oklahoma City office. 
and I was banned from going in and speaking to him. So, uh, also I challenged Tom, um, Tom Coburn, Senator Coburn of Oklahoma. It's like knowing what I know and knowing and having the evidence, I feel like I'm pretty unique is that I'm the only one that can do it in Oklahoma, and I have to. And so I went, you know, to Inhofe and then uh, Coburn. I went to a town hall last year in August, and I um, told him about all of the crimes, about um, uh, the cold case posse, Sheriff Arpaio, um, all, you know, all of the evidence about the forged uh, so, um, selective service card and the birth certificate. And uh, I got it all out there. I knew at these town hall meetings, when they hear something or think they're going to hear something they don't like, they shut you down. They start talking about you. Ask your questions. You know, they don't want to hear it. But I had a chance to tell them all about the investigation and the proof of forgery and all that. So he's like, ask your question. And said, so I said, OK, my question is, um, will you bring this to Congress and let it be investigated? And he took the, uh, Mike Zulo's number, and uh, we got it all on video where he said, I promised this young lady that I will call uh, Sheriff Arpaio. Well, he never did, and he lied about it. So we all know that. I see the heads nodding that, that they all know that he lied about that. So I had a chance to um, confront him because uh, <laughs> it's something I felt like I had to do. So he just had a town hall meeting last, last month, and I went up to, uh, um, oh, and his chief of staff knew who I was. I kept my hand raised the whole time because I had in my hand 71 pages of uh, Mike Zulo's affidavit of forgery with all the proof in it right there. So I kept my hand up, kept my hand up, and, and uh, since they knew who I was, they went all around me. His chief of staff had the microphone, and he was the one selecting who was going to ask a question. So of course, they never did ask my question. So I went up um, after to his uh, chief of staff, um, Brian, and, or, or maybe not his chief of staff, but anyway, one of his aides. And uh, um, I, got, I gave him a copy of the affidavit. And then I noticed that um, Senator Coburn hadn't left yet, and he was talking to some people. So again, you know, I had to confront him. I went up there, and I handed him the 71-page uh, affidavit of forgery. The timing was just right, you know. You know the feeling when it's just right, that's when you're going to ask him. So I get in there, and he accepts it, and he, and he looks at it, and, uh, and I explain to him what it was. And then I said, remember, um, you said you were going to call Sheriff Arpaio, and he said, I did. And I said, no, you didn't. And then he said, well, my chief of staff did. And I says, yes, yes, uh, um, you know, he did. But uh, um, my Detective Zulo told him that that wasn't going to, um, you know, that wasn't going to fulfill the obligation from Senator Coburn. And then he wanted to argue with me and all that. And he says, what, are we, what, what am I supposed to do with this or whatever? And uh, as he went out the door, you know, and he, he said, what am I supposed to do? And I said, how about tell everybody? So it was from that point um, he left uh, Miami, Oklahoma town hall, and he went to Muskogee town hall. And it was at that Muskogee town hall that he first brought up the thing that Obama is um, a approaching the you know impeachment. And he also said that there have been deliberate violations of the law. So. I know in my heart that he had two hours on that drive to look through that evidence. Yeah. Now what he does with it now, who knows? All we can do is pray that that man has seen the light, will see the light, and do something about it. Two days before uh, that town hall, Tom Coburn's town hall, I went to my representative's town hall, the one who got voted in, his name is Mark Wayne Mullen, and he was voted in. I voted for him. Um, when Dan Boren decided, because Dan Boren, remember, I chased him away because he decided he didn't want to uh, face people that are going to challenge him to a gunfight. So he was no longer running, and uh, Mark Wayne Mullen got in. So again, I went up to him. I tried to give him this 71-page um, affidavit of forgery, and he was like, does this have to do with the birth certificate? And I said, yes, and he's like, Try to give it to him, and he's like kryptonite. Not going to touch it. Not going to touch it. So uh, anyway, he made a big fool out of himself. 
Um, he even tried to, um, when I, uh, again, attempted to give it to him, and he said, really, I don't even give a SHIT. So now he's famous for that. That's when, as Pastor Manning was saying, the Blaze ran it. Uh, <laughs> the Blaze ran it. It was on Hill Buzz. It was on, um, um, anyway, all of the big liberal papers. And it was all about this idiot Mark Wayne Mullen who uh, outed himself as a, as a birther because after I left, he said, look, um, you know, I believe everything that you're saying, but there's nothing we can do about it because we lost four years ago. And, uh, you know, if we couldn't prove it, um, you know, in four years or, or prove it up to now, what makes you think you're going to, you know, anybody's going to prove it now? So this has all gone viral, and um, um, it was all about, nobody, nobody mentioned my name. No Mickey Booth, just Birther Princess, yeah. just this idiot, you know, left-wing nut that hates Obama and, uh, uh, you know, just somebody that needs to be shut down. So Al, Al Sharpton um, says, you know, that's, he says, he's, he's supporting Mark Wayne Mullen. He said, that's exactly how you treat a birther princess. You know, you just, you just uh, tell, him, uh, tell him that, uh, forget about it. You know, you're just an idiot, and I don't want to talk to you, and I'm not going to touch those papers or anything. So that brought me into my current um, predicament of notoriety, as I guess you would say. But uh, nobody cares. With all the publicity and everything, nobody cares because they, everybody gets shut down. They're afraid of it. And we know, as Pastor was saying, and um, you know, Rudy the Birther and Orly Tates and myself and even Jerome Corsi, you know, to a certain extent, that uh, they're scared of us. You know? And the issue is alive. <laughs> So I will, um, if you call on me again to come, as Fred and I said last night, we'll be here in a heartbeat. If you want us, you know, we will be here. And in closing, I want to say thank you all. Um, I know you're all doing things in your own way, and God bless you for that. And don't give up hope. There's, uh, like I said, the uh, investigation is still moving forward, and I'm trying to stay on top of that. I do stay close to Mike Zulo and... Uh, um, he lets me know, and also uh, Carl Gallops, they do the radio show, he's on his radio show just about every time he has a radio show to give any updates, so I try to let everybody know about that, and I'm staying close to that, but uh, other than um, putting out the information on Facebook and on email and stuff, I'm usually just at home, you know, with, uh, with Fred and our turkey and chickens and uh, horses and taking care of them, but... Uh, when we step out of our comfort zone and come to some place like this, it's really easy because uh, I feel such love, you know, and, and such, uh, um, you know, fondness for everyone here that uh, I, I just love it here, and I'll be back whenever you want me. Thank you very much. <laughs>